Good afternoon. The February 22nd, 2022 board work session is now in order. Paul, roll call, please. Ms. Belford? Present. Ms. McDougal? Present. Ms. Jenkins? Present. Ms. Campbell? Present. Mr. Susan? Present. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, this afternoon we'll hold a rule development session on board policy 2605 followed by a Head Start update. We are now at the rule development session. Is there anyone present who wishes to address board policy 2605 research and evaluation? Is there anyone present who wishes to address policy 2605 research and evaluation? Does any board member have anything to discuss pertaining to this policy? Ms. Campbell? Um, I had a question on letter B5. Um, that's a good question. Um, the clean copy is fine. Okay. Uh, the right of a parent to opt out of any district level data collection relating to their minor child, child that is not required by law. I know. This is probably some of the new Parents Bill of Rights stuff, but is that is that defined? Um, like, what what would it include as far as you know what is required by law, what's not required by law, what can be opted out, what can't be opted out? We don't have that defined in this, but uh, when we do an opt out, for example, if we do, we're doing research on uh, data collection, then we would send a an um, application out to a, a form out to parents saying we're doing this data collection. I don't think your microphone is on, by the way. That's, there we go. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. yep. <laughs> so if we're doing data collection, um, for example, we may do data on already if they're doing a comparison. So we would say, all right, we're going to take data not by student name, but by the third grade compared to the third grade in Pinellas County. So we could do that opt out if we were doing that kind of data collection. But if we're just doing our regular assessments and we're not identifying a student, so this would be if we were doing student identifiers. Okay. Um, the reason why, I, I mean, I just, I wanted to make sure that it's not going to cover, I mean, we're still, there's nothing um, in the Parent Bill of Rights or in this that would, like, opt out of, like, our progress monitoring, because that's, you know, are, are we having to opt in? Because we want to make sure that's really important data that we have, and actually, depending on how the legislature moves, is going to be required. Right. Um, so those are really important pieces of yeah. information. Um, according to Neola, this is about if we were going to identify students. If okay. I were going to identify Katie Campbell, the student, then we could say, you know, I don't want my student. Gotcha. Thank you. And then at letter E, the, the superintendent shall maintain a systematic accountability plan for all schools. Is that our school improvement plan? It or is, is that part else? of it, okay. but it's also the testing calendar and all of that accountability pieces that we put into place, you know, when we're going to train, when we're going to assess, what the calendar, you know, you get that testing calendar every year right. that you approve. That's what that is. Okay. All right. I just hadn't ever seen it worded quite like that, so I wanted to uh, make sure. Thank the you. language is much more, much cleaner on this version than it has previously been. Gotcha. Thank you. That's all I have. Anybody else have anything on the policy? Okay, <clears throat> that concludes the rule development session. We'll now move on to the Head Start update. Wendy Smith, Director of Head Start, will provide Im the information. Ms. Smith, Dr. Smith. Good, good morning, good afternoon. We've lost track, no, no <laughs> clock on our computers. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so last time I was here, you asked me to bring children. Yay. I tried. 
<laughs> logistics of busing being at it as it is 205 and they dismiss at 230 parent permission health and safety but I had two short videos clips um, one is internet based so we're gonna have to <laughs> forego that one but this one I want to show you is children in action using Tucker signs at one of our Head Start schools next best thing So, did the best I could <laughs> for bringing children. One day, one day, <laughs> they will be back. All right, so our PowerPoint today um, for our February 2022 workshop, as always, as always, oh my goodness, we start with the, and it's going a little slower today, I'm gonna go previous, with our vision and mission, and just remembering that it is to serve our community that includes our parents and our students, and that's gonna be an integral part of our discussion today. So I wanted to make sure to bring that to your attention. Our agenda today will be our baseline application update, enrollment, school readiness goals, community assessment, and selection criteria. Now you might have already seen a document on your, uh, in front of you with a community assessment and we'll go over that in just a bit. The baseline application, it's almost time. Our hard copy draft is going to be with you as a board review the end of February. Yes, I know that's next week, so you'll be getting it <laughs> momentarily in the next week uh, for your review and input. In March of 2022, after your review and input, it will go up as a board agenda item requesting your approval to submit the application. After that, Ms. Belford, you will need to sign it indicating submission of the application has been approved and the board participated in the development of the application. Hence today, all the board agenda meeting notes and such uh, things like that. April 1st is the due date for our next five year grant cycle. Enrollment. We are very excited to report that in February 2022, at the time of this production, 568 students were enrolled out of our 624. We are at 91% of funded enrollment, which is just incredible compared to state Head Start programs as well as throughout the nation. So kudos to our family advocates, our coaches, our teachers, our principals, our Head Start staff for getting it up to 91%. Remember the goal is 100% fully enrollment, so we are still working. Um, kids are still, we're trying to still recruit children and families, so we may get there. But we are well on our way to that 100. School readiness goals. The next slide you're going to be very familiar with. Now, our school readiness goals are a working document right now because you are going to be able to, again, provide input in them or on them as they are within our baseline grant. But we align them to the vision for excellent instruction. So this is the document that uh, you are very familiar with. You or the governing board are kept informed of the ongoing progress monitoring that we do in Head Start through board workshops, the annual report, the monthly report, the community assessment that you have in front of you that we'll discuss in a minute. And all of those documents are taken into consideration when we write Head Start School Readiness Goals. So the three that you see up here align with our vision for excellent instruction. If you take a look at the first bullet for the vision of excellent instruction, it says lessons that are consistently focused on complex content that appropriately challenge students to meet the subject and or grade level standards. Well, our team has decided that the Head Start School Readiness Goal for the next five year grant cycle 
will focus on language communication and literacy. The goal states, children will develop early literacy <coughs> knowledge and skills such as book appreciation, phonological awareness, alphabet knowledge, print concepts, and early writing. So I just would like to make sure that you know that we are aligning it to your vision for excellent instruction as part of the BPS school system. The second bullet, students who are supported to engage fully in the work of the lesson and be responsible for doing the thinking that the lesson demands. Our Head Start children will be focusing on their approach to learning. Children will develop the ability to self-regulate, manage their emotions and a variety of situations to increase independence and enhance their ability to learn. Strong goal for a three and four year old, <laughs> but we're doing it. And the last bullet that I'd like to focus on is learning environments that are safe, welcoming, and encouraging students to take the risk necessary to master the content. Head Start will focus on social and emotional development. The children will create and sustain meaningful relationships with adults and other children. Use problem solving skills to respond appropriately to others and build confidence in their own skills to fully engage in learning opportunities. Now to the bulk of our presentation, the community assessment. This community assessment was shared with you previous, previously in a um, online document. You have a, a hard copy in front of you, but let me just tell you that when you look at the online document, you are going to see many blue highlighted sections and they are actually hyperlinks. Fair warning, you may go down a rabbit hole, which <laughs> I did in some of the, um, the blue documents that you can um, click on. It's just a wealth of information. So I encourage you to also look at the online and we can send that again today so you can be more familiar with it or, or it'll be at the top of your <laughs> inbox. How's that? Um, this community assessment has been shared with you, the board, with cabinet members by Mrs. Klein, even the grant writing department of BPS, other directors, because it is such valuable information. Although it is a requirement of Head Start every five years to do the community assessment, um, the document is about Brevard County. And so we as Head Start want to make sure that all of our BPS friends are able to enjoy the, and reap the benefits of the community assessment. So this data is per, predominantly a data source from the United States um, Census Bureau 2019 American Community Survey, and it's a five-year estimate. Why do we do this community assessment? Well, number one, it's a requirement of the Head Start performance standards every five years. Number two, we take this data and then use it as a mechanism for ensuring our program re remains responsive to our community's needs at the current time. It provides a starting point for understanding our community's strengths and also I to identify the gaps. And also it informs our program planning, such as determining information for the baseline grant, service locations, and selection criteria. Now, we were presented by Mayniola, uh, that I always pronounce incorrectly, for one and a half hours. Mrs. Belford was on that call, Mrs. Du McDougall was on that call, and for about approximately 45 other people were also on the call, the presentation of the community assessment. Some of those uh, groups included our Head Start staff, our governing board, which is you, our Head Start Policy Council, which includes our parents, Food and Nutrition Services, Adult Ed, Community and Partners to include the Early Learning Coalition, the Department of Health, DCF, Brevard Zoo, Brevard Cares, Early Head Start, Early Steps, and the Space Coast Health Foundation. Now you might ask, why are these people even involved in the Head Start Community Assessment? Well, part in the back of your document, there are um, community strengths and needs that were collaborate, a collaboration with the parents of a parent survey 
and our key informant responders, which were some of these groups. And there were just questions to ask about our community. Samples in the section of the community assessment are things such as the population demographic data, socioeconomic status, housing and homelessness, transportation, disabilities, health and wellness, nutrition, adverse childhood experiences such as safety and crime, drug and alcohol abuse, child neglect, foster care. So it, it really does take in the whole community to um, provide this document for us, which is a, a basis for our next five-year grant cycle. Some of the one and a half hour highlights, I'll only make it like one or two minutes for you, um, I'm going to highlight now. And you will be able to find this in your hard copy community assessment document. So one of the research, what research states is the mother's education is significant to children's academic success. You'll actually find that on page 27 in your document. And I want to bring attention to that research statement because the next two bullets on here talk about Brevard and specifically Brevard. Of women who had a birth in the past 12 months, 10.6% in Florida and 11.6% in Brevard County have a graduate or a professional degree. Going back to that statement of the mother's education is significant to the children's academic success, giving credence to our Head Start program. Second bullet, of the 6,429 women between the ages of 15 and 50, yes, I said 50, <laughs> who gave birth in Brevard County in the past 12 months, 1,354, or 21%, were said to be living in poverty. This was something new. Maybe you knew it, and maybe I was just not as well-versed as you. But this, I found this interesting. The 2020 ALICE report. ALICE stands for Asset Limited, Income Constrained, but Employed Households. And in Brevard in 2020, of the nearly 226,363 households, 10% live below the poverty threshold, but an additional 29% were ALICE. Remember, that means households that earn above the federal poverty line, but not enough to afford basic household necessities. So data such as this drives our next baseline grant. This I found very interesting, and this is where I will tell you that I got lost in clicking on the living wage model which is uh, found on page 34. It's listed as the living wage calculator in the document highlighted in blue. And the living wage model is a measure of basic needs. It's a market-based approach and draws upon expenditure data such as minimum food requirement, child care, health insurance, housing, transportation, and other necessities such as clothing and personal items. The living wage draws on these cost elements to determine the minimum employment earnings necessary to meet a family's basic needs while maintaining self-sufficiency. As we look on to some of the documents in the levy, or the data from the living wage model, in Florida, the hourly living wage for a single parent with two children is $38.04. The hourly living wage for a two-parent household where one adult is working with two children is $32.28. Remember, not what they earn, but a combination of all those things that they need to make sure that they can live independently. Look at that compared to the poverty wages for these two types of families. Poverty wage for a single parent with two children is $10.44 an hour, and the poverty wage for two-parent household with two children is $12.60 an hour. The minimum wage at the time of this printing of the community assessment 
in Florida was $10 per hour. So you can see the concern and the discrepancy uh, amongst those numbers. The living wage for a single family, or I'm sorry, single parent family with two children in Florida is $79,126, which is three times the federal poverty level for a family of three, which is documented at 21960 So as you can see, when, when we were getting the presentation and we were, uh, they were highlighting some of these things, my mouth was open, fell open, and uh, just was just very, very telling of what our uh, community is going through. Another highlight is the cost of home ownership and also child care. The main things coming out of this one and a half hour report, the parents and the community members and the data show that there are two major concerns. One is affordable housing in Brevard County and two is affordable house, uh, child care. So let's look at home, home ownership and rental units. The cost in Brevard, Brevard County for those earning a minimum wage must work 97 hours a week to afford a two bedroom home at fair market rental value. When we go to childcare, another one of the major concerns, and this, this one's on page 81. I'm sorry, I was meaning to tell you the page numbers. Back for the childcare is page 81. The slide before the housing and homelessness was on page 46, just for your reference. Based on the childcare cost of Child Care Aware of America, the annual cost for infant child care in a center-based program is $9,312 a year. Look what's highlighted in parentheses. Compared to public college tuition, which is annually $6,360. Child care for an infant and a four-year-old is $16,314 a year. Single parents earning Florida's standard living wage, remember those are the families who aren't in poverty, they pay 34.7% of their income for infant center care. And then married parents of two children living at the poverty line pay 65% of their household income for center-based child care. Another part of the community assessment highlights was health literacy. You can find this on page 66. And the health literacy is defined as the ability to read, comprehend, and communicate health-related information. Well, look what we just went through, are going through getting out of the health crisis. And research showing that this health care activities are unfamiliar, complicated, and technical to most people. Even people who read well and are comfortable using numbers can face health literacy issues. Hence our focus on our, with our Head Start program, with our dental hygienist, our family advocates, helping our families get to the doctor, to the dentist, immunizations, well care visits, things like that. But the health literacy, this was the most current data because it's collected once every five years from 2012 to 2017. Level one, if you take a look at level one, this is adults at this level can be considered at risk for difficulties using or comprehending the print material. In Brevard County in 2017, 16% of our community members fell at level one compared to Florida at 24% and the United States at 22%. Our level two, our adults at this level can be considered nearing proficiency, but still may struggle to perform tasks with text-based information. Brevard County, 34% of our adults. In Florida, 34% of our adults. And United States, 32% of all adults. And finally, level three, adults at this level can be considered proficient at working with information and text and ideas, where Brevard County fell at 50%, Florida at 42, 
and United States at 46. So that was a quick overview of the one and a half hour presentation that Maniola provided to us. But like I said, all of the information and documentation is in there for you in hard copy with your uh, community assessment that's in front of you. And I will have the electronic document sent to you again today so that you can use those uh, hyperlinks. The last thing that I'd want to discuss is the selection criteria. As a board responsibility includes looking at the selection criteria for Head Start, oftentimes people consider Head Start a program for children at the poverty level, and that's it. And that is a, a big part of it. However, I would like to share with you part of our selection criteria for your awareness. If you take a look at the first two blue highlighted sections, these have nothing to do with income. So when a family advocate meets with a family, a parent or a guardian for an eligibility meeting, certain questions are asked and determine the need of service for that family. For instance, under parent and guardian status, it is asked, are you a grandparent or a non-parent as the primary caregiver? And as you can see across the line, there's a certain amount of points that are provided for that family. Are you a foster parent? Are, is your child, are you homeless? Do you receive public assist, assistance such as TANF or SSI? Moving to the second blue line, it's the disabilities section. So children with disabilities are able to participate in our Head Start program. Actually, we're required to have 10% of our uh, student population as those that we serve with an IEP. Sometimes Head Start can't provide the services needed for a pre-K student, they may go to our pre-K uh, BE classroom, the old ELP classroom, or another program um, outside of BPS, but Head Start does have students who have IEPs. So does a child currently have an IEP and is there documentation for that? Or are they suspected of a disability where we are, are in the school system, we can test and evaluate? The third section is income. So families do receive points if they are zero to 100% of the federal poverty guideline to include foster homeless SSI and TANF. There's a certain point determination for that, as well as if you are 101% to 130% of the federal poverty guideline. And the last section for our selection criteria that we use also has nothing to do with income. Has your child previously attended a Head Start or an Early Head Start program? Does your child have dental needs? Does an immediate family in the home, is there immediate family in the home without health or dental insurance? Is English not your primary language? Does the child receive WIC or have a chronic health condition such as asthma, diabetes, heart disease, sickle cell disease? weight concern or IN deficiencies? Are both parents or guardians in a two-parent home or a single parent without a high school diploma or a GED? Does one parent in a two-parent home without a high school diploma? Or is the child currently living with a teenage parent or a parent who was a teenager at the time of birth? Has the family experienced trauma in the last 12 months, such as homeless homelessness, divorce or separation, death, life-threatening illness, alcohol or drug abuse, domestic violence, incarceration, felony living within the home or an open investigation for uh, suspected child abuse or neglect. And it includes also currently the loss of a job for a household member due to the pandemic. And finally, has the family received a referral from a community agency for the applicant, such as child fine, DCF, fiddlers, or et cetera. So I just wanted to bring your attention to it's not just what a family makes that determines uh, their eligibility for Head Start, but we do take a look at many other factors. That is the Head Start presentation for today. Are there any questions? Any board members have any questions for Dr. Smith? 
real quick. First of all, thank you very much for your work and for the video and um, for giving us these resources. When you, I, I know we, I think I'd had this conversation um, with you before about the, the percentage. So um, I know that we're actually, you said there's 10% are required to have an IEP in our Head Start program. Also, there's like a 10% that has, that are, can be above the federal poverty line. Is that, am I remembering that correctly? 10% is the IEP, and that's the goal to right. have, have that. And then is it 10% or 130%? It can just be any. 10% over the federal poverty guidelines. Okay. But they can also meet some of these other criteria Oh, absolutely. As well. How do we, because we have the ESC um, DPK programs, how do we, um, how do we place people, I guess, is the question. This may be more of a miskind question, because I mean, it's kind of a balance. We have lots of opportunities um, for VPK. So how, is it just kind of parent directed or it is depends there like a screening on the process? services of the IEP of where their placement can go okay. for the uh, pre K B E classroom right. that's determined with an IEP meeting and the team opening up the evaluation and seeing if they if their needs are met there. They also have to qualify, you know, for head start, not right. just have an IEP. That's Separate why that selection that. committee I mean criteria is listed there. Right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yeah. I have a quick one for you. Okay. On that, uh, the criteria that, that they be either below or between 100 and 130 percent of the federal poverty mm -hmm. uh, guideline, is that set by us or is that set by Head Start? Head Start. Okay. Is it 130, 110 to 130 set by Head Start? Not for Upper Broad County, not by the governing board. You okay. are correct. So um, j just an observation, and I don't know if they have considered it, but if you look at our poverty guideline and you look at our living wage, mm -hmm. the living wage is significantly more than 130% of the poverty line. So I'm so glad you brought that up. Mm -hmm. When we meet as a team for our selection committee and we look at all of the information that is on the document that I just shared with you, we can go above that. Uh, we have to write to the Office of Head Start and give a reason, and could we use this uh, newest community assessment for that? Yes, and we are excited for that opportunity. So although that, that baseline is set of that 10%, if we go over, we can use this as justification. Okay. And then kind of as a, as a follow-up to that, in the event that a family's income is, say, at 150% of the poverty level, mm -hmm. but they have so many of these other factors, mm -hmm. they're not excluded, right? Absolutely. It's based you on the correct. overall points? You are correct. Okay. You are correct. And that's why it's not just an income-based program, and right. we take a look at all of their other needs. Super. Good thank question. you. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you for thank all of your work with our, our youngest learners and, and all you do for the community as well. Thank you. Critically important. All right. Anyone have anything else before I gavel us out for a couple hours? Hearing no further business, this meeting is adjourned.